Institute. This is the Institute uh, for Engaged Learning. Uh, it's uh, headquartered uh, at our respective institutions, as well as one more, as we'll uh, see in the talk. Um, I'm James Lester. I'm a faculty member in computer science at North Carolina State University. Uh, let me introduce my uh, colleagues. I should say that uh, I'm also PI on the uh, on the Institute. Uh, and let me introduce uh, our three speakers uh, today and um, Again, uh, so happy uh, to have such a great group of uh, people in the audience, uh, and uh, let me introduce my colleagues. Cindy Mellis Silver is Distinguished Professor and Barbara B. Jacobs Chair in Education and Technology. She's also Director of the Center for Research on Learning and Technology at Indiana University. Gautam Biswas is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Engineering and Professor of Computer Science and Computer Engineering at Vanderbilt. And Jeremy Rochelle is Executive Director of Learning Science Research at Digital Promise. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen and please let me know if it meets with success or does not. Uh, confirming you can see the screen. Excellent. Um, so the format of our uh, panel today is uh, I'll provide about a 10 minute overview of the Institute, uh, and then we'll proceed uh, with uh, Cindy Mello Silver uh, talking about the learning sciences work at the Institute, uh, Gautam Biswas uh, talking about the uh, multimodal learning analytics work uh, at the Institute, uh, and finally, uh, Jer Jeremy Rochelle talking about uh, the Nexus work. Um, the National Science Foundation AI Institute for Engaged Learning uh, is, I think, a uh, very interesting organization uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's currently one of three education-focused uh, institutes uh, in AI in the U.S., um, and there are perhaps a couple more uh, going to be coming online uh, soon. The NSF AI Institute for Engaged Learning um, focuses on uh, uh, two areas. So one is uh, innovations in core AI, that is uh, advances in AI that uh, really move the needle in what AI is capable of uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, the complementary set of advances in uh, applications of AI uh, to education. This is a uh, five organization uh, institute. So we're headquartered at NC State. Uh, where I am. Uh, Moet Bonsal, who is not with us today, uh, is our core AI lead. So Moet's uh, expertise is in natural language processing and machine learning. Uh, he's at the University of North Carolina, North, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is just down the road. Uh, Gautam uh, is at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, which is in uh, Nashville, and I should say Gautam and his team and Moet and his team. Uh, Cindy uh, and her team are at Indiana. Uh, university. And uh, Jeremy's at Digital Promise, who we show on the West Coast, but it's actually a bi-coastal uh, organization. <laughs> uh, Jeremy's not only on the, uh, the West Coast, uh, but Digital Promise has offices in uh, Washington as well. So this collection uh, of um, organizations makes for, uh, as you can uh, perhaps imagine, a very rich set uh, of connections, not only um, across the universities um, and uh, Digital Promise, which is a nonprofit, uh, but also uh, across disciplines. And uh, I think one of the most interesting things about uh, these um, NSF AI institutes is the uh, incredible multidisciplinarity that they support. Um, for the Engage AI Institute, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, several different areas. Uh, first, there's what uh, we might call the AI and education uh, contingent. This is my own uh, background. Uh, these are typically uh, researchers who have uh, many years of experience uh, working literally at the intersection of AI and ed. So you might think of our home conference as being the AI and ed uh, conference. We uh, are deeply interested in applications uh, of AI in education to make learning better, to make teaching better, uh, and so forth. Um, now, if you sort of uh, move uh, a little bit uh, to the left in this graphic here, uh, Cindy Mello-Silver uh, heads up the 
uh, learning sciences work of the Institute. So really trying to understand how people can learn with these new technologies, how teachers can teach uh, with these new technologies, um, and deeply understanding what it means to do that in the rich context where we're uh, studying this, as I'll uh, describe in just a moment. Uh, Gautam works on multimodal learning analytics. So Gautam and I are both in uh, AI and education and learning uh, analytics. Um, and then Jeremy, who uh, hails from the learning sciences, but actually uh, is um, really uh, in charge, uh, uh, sort of our spiritual leader, uh, I think, and kind of the community-based and uh, outreach and broader impacts aspects of the work uh, of the Institute. So you'll see here uh, a lot of smiling uh, uh, faces. I won't go into to each of these, but I'll say that uh, there are a good number of people who are from the learning sciences. Uh, so these are uh, young, uh, mid-career, uh, more senior faculty that work on the learning sciences. The same is true for AI and education. Uh, and uh, the same is true for our core AI, uh, which is led by uh, MOET. So uh, it's multidisciplinary, uh, it's multi-organizational. Uh, and as um, uh, I often say to colleagues who ask about what's it like to be uh, in one of these AI institutes. I have to say it's incredibly educational because it's just impossible uh, not to uh, be working on one of the many, many projects that are active in the Institute and learn a lot. It's just impossible. It's such a rich uh, set of ongoing uh, discussions and research initiatives uh, that we'll try to share just a little flavor of uh, today. Um, one of the real uh, sort of core design uh, decisions that was made early uh, in the Engage AI Institute um, was having, as I said early on, this kind of dual focus of use-inspired AI research and foundational AI research. So uh, we have three uh, foci within uh, the use-inspired side. That's what uh, we'll be talking about over the next few minutes, narrative-centered learning, body conversational agents, and multimodal learning analytics. And then there are uh, parallel um, uh, foci and foundational AI research on natural language processing, computer vision, and machine learning. And all of these come together. Uh, you can sort of imagine uh, the rich set of projects that inhabits every single one of these cells. Uh, so for example, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but uh, you can just imagine uh, all the work that's going on uh, in uh, machine learning for embodied conversational agents. We'll, we'll briefly uh, talk about that, but it's true for all of the, all of the cells. And of course, there's the uh, really important foundation in ethical AI, which we'll be uh, touching on today as well. AI-empowered learning uh, R&D for the Engage AI Institute uh, really means looking at uh, three uh, sets of research initiatives uh, that are all uh, interlocked. Uh, the first is AI-driven narrative-centered learning environments, which itself has uh, three parts, narrative-centered learning, body conversational agents, and multimodal learning analytics. That's where we'll be focusing our discussion uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Uh, but I also want to mention that there is uh, underpinning this uh, deep work, and I, I mean that both uh, well, sort of literally um, uh, in the sense of uh, deep learning models, but also figuratively in the sense that we're really advancing um, uh, core AI and NLP, uh, computer vision and ML. Uh, and then finally, uh, with this operating in a very tight feedback uh, loop of use-inspired research and foundational AI research, uh, the uh, design specifications that one is feeding, uh, the functionalities that the other is feeding, um, all of these leading to uh, what's really the goal of all the work that we do, which is educational impact, not only in school, uh, but also uh, out of school. Um, as you'll uh, see from this graphic, uh, there are ethics components to every single one uh, of the three areas of work. Uh, I hope we'll get to talk about these uh, a good deal today in the, in the Q&A. AI-powered uh, learning environments are, uh, I think, particularly uh, interesting from a narrative-centered perspective, which is uh, the one that we're working from. Uh, you can sort of imagine a narrative being embodied by embodied conversational agents and multimodal uh, learning analytics. And when I say narrative, um, you can kind of imagine different realizations uh, of that narrative. So you could imagine it an interactive uh, science mystery, for example, where it's playing out on a screen. Uh, here you see uh, a couple of students that are uh, interacting with the narrative. Um, one of the real themes of uh, all of our work is collaborative uh, learning. So uh, collaborative inquiry uh, in a story-based setting uh, opens up a lot of really interesting questions 
um, about how AI should be designed to support that and um, how uh, should AI uh, be designed to support that. Um, so we're seeing it here on a screen. You can certainly imagine uh, in the coming years uh, as AR becomes uh, less and less expensive um, and uh, less and less cumbersome to work with, um, that the so-called uh, realization layer uh, of um, all of the narrative-centered learning environment work uh, needn't be on a screen. And in fact, it could be uh, very much in an actually immersive world uh, in the classroom. And I should point out, although we won't be talking about it today, uh, there's a, a very rich area of work going on in the Institute on embodied learning, which is in fact quite immersive uh, physically uh, in uh, the classroom that um, uh, Joshua Danish and uh, Noel Inuity are heading up. So when students interact with uh, a narrative, uh, you can kind of imagine that they're really interacting uh, not only with each other, uh, but also with embodied conversational agents within uh, a narrative-centered learning environment. And that narrative-centered learning environment is making decisions about uh, what the story world should be like. What is the 3D world that the students are inhabiting uh, defined by? Uh, how is the plot being adapted for uh, the uh, students and their problem-solving activities? How are all the behaviors of the characters, and in particular, uh, the conversations uh, of those characters, uh, how are those customized for the interactions that students are having? And then finally, how does the learning context um, influence the models that are driving uh, all of the uh, story world generation, plot generation, and character generation. So for example, in um, uh, AI and Ed, we're very familiar with uh, student models, but uh, of course, to really make this uh, work uh, kind of in the large and at scale, uh, you need to have very rich representations of teachers and uh, of groups, uh, not to mention locale models uh, and so forth. Um, I'm kind of describing this as it's playing out in a, a classroom, uh, but in fact, we also work in museums. Uh, just this last week, uh, we wound up a study uh, in a museum uh, looking at narrative-centered learning in the context of uh, science. And you can well imagine that the kind of design requirements that uh, informal uh, learning contexts such as science museums place on narrative are quite different than uh, you see in classrooms. Uh, for one thing, the kind of visit times or dwell times uh, tend to be much shorter, uh, which means that the uh, kind of level of engagement, but also uh, fundamentally the interactions uh, need to be responsive uh, to those. Um, I'll just mention as I'm uh, about to wind up uh, that we're doing uh, a lot of really interesting work uh, right now uh, as we speak uh, on uh, reinforcement learning models for driving uh, the interactive narrative. So interactive narrative actually has a very rich history uh, in AI. Interactive narrative technologies have been around for about 20 years now. Um, but only in maybe the last, say, five or six or seven years have these really begun to uh, mature. Uh, and currently, we're looking at systems that can learn policies that can then uh, guide uh, the narrative. Um, one of the really interesting aspects of this is that this is true for any kind of RL uh, system, whether it's for pedagogy uh, or for other uh, kinds of applications of reinforcement learning, is that the amount of data required is just fabulously large. Um, not only much larger than we typically deal with in education, but much larger than uh, Fortune 500 companies have available to them. Um, so this creates this kind of really interesting question of how do you create uh, synthetic data uh, that's informed by real data uh, that can augment training in a way uh, that lets the system learn policies that can then generate narratives uh, that are not only engaging, uh, but also uh, pedagogically uh, effective. Um, we're currently uh, uh, right in the middle of our, um, uh, I, I think of it as a, an ECA, Embodied Conversational Agent, push <clears throat> on using large language models. Uh, we're currently working on uh, uh, four different approaches um, but just at the, the highest possible level, uh, I'll mention the embodied conversational agents, which uh, Cindy will uh, talk about in just a moment, uh, really uh, kind of operate uh, at two different levels. On uh, the one hand, there's speech. Uh, so this means speech in, uh, speech reco, uh, all the really interesting natural language understanding uh, issues and the management of dialogue. Uh, the flip side of that, generating natural language, uh, speech synthesis uh, to create all the, the spoken conversations. Um, and then uh, parallel uh, to that is all of the multimodal 
uh, uh, communication that goes on of nonverbal behaviors, uh, not only of students, so for example, facial expression, gaze, uh, and so forth, uh, but also the synthesis of behaviors uh, on the part of the agents for uh, the same kinds of um, uh, facial expression, gaze, posture, uh, and so forth. And so coordinating these, understanding these, uh, these are really, really interesting uh, problems, not only from an NLP and a machine learning uh, perspective, uh, but also uh, from a pedagogy uh, perspective. Krista uh, Glazuski is heading up our uh, ECA team that's looking at uh, scaffolding uh, design, which I think is uh, particularly exciting. Um, so uh, Gautam will talk a little bit uh, about uh, core AI methods as they uh, are informing multimodal uh, learning analytics. Um, and then I just want to uh, wrap up uh, my little section by saying we're uh, driven by this kind of waterfall model uh, of a research uh, progression. Um, so we're looking for not just kind of incremental advances, but really fundamental breakthroughs uh, in narrative-centered learning uh, technologies. Uh, as we're seeing more and more generative AI models uh, come online, this is becoming uh, increasingly uh, possible. In fact, uh, one of the really interesting challenges is that these models are so powerful, they're in some ways too powerful. Uh, so we're having to think about uh, what does it mean to direct them uh, in a way that's the most um, uh, useful uh, pedagogically, uh, but also that we can be confident in how they behave in uh, classrooms and museums and so forth. Um, that's going to inform uh, the development of integrated narrative-centered learning environments with all the capabilities that we've talked about. Um, and then uh, ultimately, really at the end of the day, what we're interested in are uh, narrative-centered learning environments that can operate at scale, that can really um, work in many different kinds of learning contexts. Um, and uh, I'll say around the country, but really this is an international audience so, uh, around the world. Um, finally, uh, just to um, uh, conclude by saying we're deeply interested in uh, the AI uh, ethics, what I sometimes call the AI ed ethics uh, of these problems. Uh, and they really play out uh, not only at the core AI level uh, where there's a lot of discussion right now, uh, but also in interesting ways in narrative-centered learning, uh, trust, for example, how can you, uh, how can a teacher uh, be confident that the kinds of narrative-centered learning experiences that will happen are uh, uh, respecting um, uh, the kinds of uh, guidelines and principles that are uh, beginning to emerge, mm -hmm. uh, what it means to have a good narrative-centered learning experience. Um, and then, of course, uh, DEI uh, more broadly. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to Cindy. Thanks, James, um, and I am delighted to be here. I'm going to just start by saying a little bit about how um, Engage AI addresses some really important challenges for education. Um, as we think about how do we develop narrative-centered learning environments that create problem contexts that will be relevant for learners, help them see, in particular, we're focusing on STEM, as addressing societal challenges and provide opportunity for learner agency. From a learning sciences perspective, we try to use sociocultural theories to think about how we design our learning environments and how we study them as we think about providing contexts that support extended engagement with important disciplinary contents and practices. But these create learning environments with a lot of moving parts. So helping teachers manage or orchestrate these parts will be a priority. And that leads us to the overarching research questions that I will talk about. Next slide. James, can you, you advance the slide? Ah, oops. So our first question is, is very much student focused. How can we create AI driven narrative centered learning environments that promote student agency to support STEM learning and engagement during collaborative inquiry? Um, so we think about how do we design environments that give students choices in what they do, provide opportunities for them to take responsibility for their actions and make decisions about how they learn as they engage in meaningful tasks, and in particular in collaborative tasks. So our approach is to create a theoretical framework for student agency during collaborative inquiry in these environments, to devise methods for dynamically promoting or constraining student and group agency in narrative-centered learning environments, um, both to provide agency, but also to help steer and guide students in ways that address both important learning objectives and standards, 
as well as disciplinary practices um, and the like. We're doing a systematic literature review right now on narrative-centered learning, trying to understand what are the ranges of ways that these narrative-centered learning environments have been used, whether in problem-based learning, narrative inquiry, games, um, and what the role, different roles that students take, what the different kinds of tasks are. Um, we're also conducting focus groups and co-design activities along with pilot studies with middle school students and teachers to drive our designs. And we've, we've just um, done our first round of teacher focus groups, which has been really exciting, as well as getting some preliminary data from some student focus groups. Next slides. Um, for our student focused research questions, we use a whole range of different data sources as we try to both have data for the multimodal learning analytics, but also for the behavioral research. So we, we use video and observation. Um, we're looking at do students learn the content and disciplinary practices. We're collecting clickstream data, um, a whole range of different kinds of data to be able to understand engagement, to understand learning both individually and in groups. And that, that's the theme as we go throughout is that we're interested in what's going on collaboratively as well as with individual students. Um, as we try to look at the feasibility of our approaches, the usability, create proof of concepts and to refine our multimodal learning analytics. Next slide. Our second question is, is about teachers. These learning environments have a lot of moving parts. You've got technology, collaboration, inquiry, a, a range between indiv individual students, groups, small group discussion, as well as what's going on in the whole class. So one of the things that is really important is to create AI-driven orchestration support tools to help teachers manage collaborative inquiry in these complex environments. And we see teachers as a really important part of, of these learning environments, um, both in terms of co-designing AI enhanced tools that help the teacher understand the student's states um, and what the students are, are doing at the moment. And as we did our pilot studies this, this fall, um, that was something that the teachers really wanted to know more about was what was going on in different groups. Um, we're developing storyboards and focus groups um, to, to begin our code design. Um, we've got questions about AI ethics, as well as making efforts to engage both teachers and students from underrepresented groups. Next slide. And here we're gonna look at, um, again, a range of different resources. Um, the teachers' voices are gonna be really important as we try to develop case studies of adaptation and local relevance, equitable use of learning analytics, and in particular, we also want to know both about the orchestration load that this is placing on teachers. So how much, what, what extra um, work is it adding and how can we reduce that and help it improve teachers' ability to be able to orchestrate their classroom? So again, we're trying to look at usability and feasibility of the MMLA, ways that the embodied conversational agents can take on some of this scaffolding um, functions and which things are best left to the teacher. So thinking about how do we distribute the scaffolding among different elements of the system, um, as well as looking at how do we use NLP and computer vision um, for professional development and, and multimodal learning analytics. Next slide. As part of this, we're gonna use, do multi-party dialogue analysis of the collaborative learning discourse. I'm particularly excited about this as somebody who spends many, many hours manually coding discourse data. Um, so looking both at chat-based student communication and then speech-based student communication, there's work going on now on multi-party dialogue summarization and trying to use language-based social interaction, student modeling, identifying social roles that students tend to take um, identifying productive and unproductive interactions, for example, um, looking at how leadership emerges in some of the small groups and ways that that helps groups be productive is something I'm particularly interested. Um, predicting learning outcomes based on these collaborative learning discourse and trying to identify the characteristics of 
groups that are productive and how those different learning activities affect what students take away from their interactions. Next slide. Um, when we're, we talk about embodied conversational agents, where we think of them in several ways, um, as scaffolding, as pedagogical agents, where they might give students hints and prompts, as virtual learning companions, as teachable agents and cognitive assistants for teachers. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, there's several roles. The pedagogical agents um, have roles of mentoring, of storytelling-based learning that work with the students directly to engage in learning conversations. Um, virtual learning companions that are near peers um, at student com competency levels where um, this may also be combined with teachable agents uh, that can serve as non-player characters in the stories. Next slide. The teachable agents, um, this builds on uh, Gautam Biswas's work on learning by teaching, where students teach agents who are simulated students who learn that will also, again, be non-player char characters and can help in abstracted replays of reviewing dialogues as cognitive assistance for teachers that may be able to serve as teaching assistants, um, engage in teaching conversations, provide advice for teachers. Uh, as we think about our orchestration assistants, we're thinking about what kind of strategy advice that um, these cognitive assistants might provide, building on what we know about teachers and what great teachers do to support collaborative inquiry. Next slide. And I am done. So I believe I pass it off to Gautam. Thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, again, uh, really glad to be here making this uh, presentation. I know uh, a number of you are attending in all kinds of time zones from very early morning to very late at night. So we really appreciate your, your being here. So James, if I can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, if if you aren't already impressed with all of the challenges that uh, James and uh, Cindy have presented, here's another one to think about. Uh, so let's think of a classroom of the future where we have a lot of advanced technologies, right? It's not students just sitting at a desk and listening to the teacher, maybe once in a while opening up uh, 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 an iPad or, or a laptop and, and doing some work on it, but, but really a, a narrative-centered learning environment where a, a whole scenario evolves and, and the entire classroom is in, in involved in that scenario, some of them in, in say, in different ways. So you, you still have the teacher that is uh, doing the instruction, right, interacting with the students, but then in, in this classroom of the future, students will be interacting with each other in small groups, sometimes working individually, sometimes going up to these uh, advanced technologies such as whiteboards to discuss, say, notes that the teacher has put up, in other cases, uh, working on, on their uh, systems, as uh, James pointed out, uh, looking at different aspects of the narrative-centered learning environment, finding the STEM problems that they have to be to solve and working on it. And uh, I guess in order to understand this classroom and understand the classroom dynamics, there now you can see that there's a lot of different kinds of data that we have to collect. Fortunately, technology has advanced enough that we can collect uh, rich video data. We can collect a lot of conversations between the teachers and students amongst the students themselves. Uh, we have um, advanced, developed advanced technologies where we can record the activities that students are working on uh, in, in, within the environment as they solve problems. We can use additional sensors for uh, like uh, uh, eye tracking units to, to, uh, to track their gestures. We can again use video to, to, uh, to do gesture track, tracking. And so the idea is how do we 
collect and use all this data in an effective manner. So in other words, we are talking about multimodal learning analytics, taking this raw data from multiple sources, right, pre-processing, aligning then and analyzing them so that we can provide useful information to teachers, students, and, and even other stakeholders. So if we can go on to the next slide. So here, here is an example of uh, the current technology, but of course, uh, in a much more limited sense. So you have students working on, uh, say, Crystal Island, which is uh, a narrative-centered learning environment, but students are working individually on the laptops. But the teacher has the ability to track what different students are doing, and the teacher can switch between uh, different students, uh, especially to identify where students may be having difficulties and then maybe interacting with them. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. And uh, we are not just thinking of uh, in-classroom environments. As uh, James mentioned earlier, we are thinking of both formal and informal learning environments. And as James pointed out, when you are in an informal uh, learning environment, such as a museum exhibit, we are tracking using the same kinds of sensors to track uh, user activity and conversations. But here, maybe we are interested in a different set of metrics, for example, by looking at the time spent at an exhibit to determine interest and engagement in that particular exhibit, looking at some of the conversations to see what students are highlighting in the particular exhibit that they're, that they're observing, and not as much as uh, learning, but looking at engagement and interest. So if we can go on to the next slide. So with this overview of, of uh, uh, our approach to multimodal analytics. Uh, let me present a set of uh, challenges. So from what I've said, as you can notice, whether we're working in formal or informal learning and environments, we will be collecting a lot of multimodal data, which is data from different sensors, heterogeneous sensors that we have to then pre-process and align before we can process them using, say, advanced machine learning methods to, to draw inferences about student learning and student learning behaviors. Uh, since we are working in classroom and, and uh, out-of-classroom environments, these environments are going to be noisy. Uh, you know, there, there are multiple people who are conversing and doing things at once. So how to identify how certain groups and how they are interacting is, is a non-trivial process. Uh, we are going to use uh, rich video data to, uh, uh, using motion tracking methods, gesture and uh, recognition, uh, you know, uh, head tracking, et cetera, to see how students are uh, interacting with each other. Uh, then we are also going to use uh, both the conversations, the, the video, as well as the log data to interpret students' cognitive and metacognitive behaviors, the social processes when they are interacting as they, as they collaborate. And we have to figure out, uh, for example, how to combine these multimodal streams so that we can make the appropriate inferences that I just talked about right now. So one of the challenges we face here is not working on individual data streams as has traditionally been done, but how to combine these data streams using advanced machine learning algorithms and draw inferences that are much richer and less ambiguous than if we had worked on individual data streams. And, and another challenge we face is, say we will be collecting data over a, a class period, which is over an hour. Obviously, we are not going to analyze that whole, that entire data as, as uh, one interval of time. We will have to figure uh, out how to break it down into segments uh, so such that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of identify interesting segments and figure out what we would need to analyze within those segments, both to inform the teachers and if necessary, the students who are embodied conversational agents to help them uh, advance in their learning tasks. So if you go on to the next slide. So uh, to get into a, a little more detail, so I talked about the, the multidimensional data that we are collecting and having to process, what are the kinds of inferences that we are going to try to draw from the data? So, so this slide 
provides uh, information on a number of different dimensions at, uh, in which we are going to study uh, student learning. Some of it is beha behavioral. It starts with, you know, when, when they are working on a complex task, right? How do they per persist on it? How do they advance in their problem solving uh, tasks? Uh, you know, when do they get disengaged, right? And why, right? How to bring them uh, 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 back and 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 get them engaged. There are also these various socio socio emotional uh, uh, factors like uh, you know since they are collaborating, how do they collaborate? What are their uh, the different modes in which they are interacting with each other? This will primarily be through audio and gaze, but but also through their uh, you know uh, through gestures and other facial expressions they make. Can we track these uh, using our multimodal methods and and be and understand the collaborative processes that students are using? When it comes to collaborative processes, we are certainly interested in how they are interacting together. So joint attention. But uh, since we are looking at their, at their learning, we are interested in the collaborative processes which involve uh, how they're pooling together information. So, you know, how different uh, so, sort of students within a group are elaborating on what they know then how they come to a consensus, especially if there are differences in their understanding and how then they go about co-constructing that, that, that these different pieces of knowledge and apply them to uh, pro, uh, their pro problems or solving tasks. Again, from a metacognitive viewpoint, we are looking at how they regulate their knowledge through various strategies. This is this notion of socially shared uh, regulation of learning in collaborative learning environments. And certainly, as I mentioned before, since we are interested in their learning and problem solving, we are tracking their disciplinary learning. So as they converse, as they work on the system, right? how are they advancing in their STEM knowledge? Where are they having difficulties? And in some cases, we are also looking at combination of STEM plus computer computing knowledge, which has become a hot topic nowadays. So if we can go on to the next slide. So in, in terms of uh, user-inspired uh, AI research, to, to summarize what I've just said, we are looking uh, to identify visual indicators of uh, high and low quality engagement and interaction among students in these collaborative learning environments that can be at different levels. It can be at the classroom level, it could be groups, or it could even be individuals. It can be in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And what we want to develop is a general set of multimodal analy analysis techniques uh, you know, uh, that can process video speech, eye tracking and activity log data to draw the kinds of inferences that I talked about earlier. Uh, uh, so the current approach is we are trying to define what high quality student engagement means. This is work Cindy and her group are doing from a learning sciences uh, perspective. Then uh, as, as the multimodal analytics group, we are also interacting with our core AI and ML researchers who are con conceptualizing and designing and developing these advanced machine learning algorithms that they can apply to the data that, that we are collecting uh, in, in order to provide help us uh, you know, come up with the inferences that we are looking for. Uh, currently, we are looking at uh, data we've collected from previous studies that we've uh, run on narrative-centered learning environments, primarily uh, Crystal Island, on some collaborative uh, learning work that Cindy and her group have done, and some of the work that we have uh, been doing in ste collaborative STEM plus C, uh, C learning using the C2STEM uh, environment. Uh, and in and in the fall of 2022 and 20 uh, in the fall of 2022 we've been designing a multimodal learning analysis pipeline and in, in the spring of 2023 we'll be applying it to data that we have collected this fall from some of our environments if we can go to the next slide so just to give you an example uh, uh, here is uh, uh, where we've studied joint attention. So these are uh, two uh, pairs of students who are working on building computational models of uh, physics problems. So we can see different kinds of attention. So in the first one on the left, uh, uh, you can see two students who are focusing on the screen. They're trying to look at 
uh, a, a graph to, and, and debug the problems that they are having in the computational model that they're building. If you look to the right, uh, the, here there's lack of joint attention. These are two students working together. The student on, on the right is trying to explain to the student on the left as to uh, how to construct the model, but the student on the left isn't showing much attention. You can uh, see that she is uh, not as much engaged with the screen as the first two students were. And the, and the one on uh, below is quite interesting because here we find one of the students, uh, they, uh, here the students are again debugging their model, but one of the students is questioning the other, getting them to think and reflect on why their, uh, you know, their model has uh, produced a certain result that they are seeing. So, so we are going to extend these kind of methods, not just look at pairs of students, but groups of students working in classroom environments to, to derive this information of, uh, you know, of joint attention and other collaborative processes by, by analyzing a co combination of multimodal data. So if we can go to the next slide. So, uh, uh, Another direction that we are looking at is not just to analyze this data so that, for example, we can inform our embodied conversational agents to provide feedback or, or to uh, figure out ways in which we can tweak the narrative-centered learning environments, but we need to have our teachers very much involved in this process. And uh, it's going to be new for our teachers too to be dealing with multimodal data. So how do we get them to notice different situations uh, that, that occur in a classroom? Uh, and then uh, how do we uh, work with them so that they can then translate what they notice into actionable information to support student learning? There's also this other issue since we are collecting classroom data, we can look at when uh, different groups are working to it together, whether the teacher is distributing their time equitably between the different groups so that, uh, you know, attention is not just given to a small set of groups, but to the entire classroom. The next slide, please. And, and uh, so uh, here, and this work is being led by Chris Glavisky, as uh, James mentioned earlier, uh, so we are looking at ways in which we can uh, use some of this multimodal data to, in, uh, to in, inform teacher professional development. And we will do this by co-designing uh, dashboards using multimodal data uh, with, with our uh, teachers so that A, we can build uh, better embodied conversational agents to provide feedback to students, but also conversational agents that might be able to interact with these teachers and help them with their noticing. And then eventually with also, uh, uh, you know, deriving actionable information from what they might notice. And uh, of course, this work uh, is going to be done in both formal and informal uh, learning environments. We do want to analyze these reflective dialogues on teacher noticing and, and also get teachers to, to pay attention to fair distributions of, of, their, you know, for, of their attention in classrooms. If you can move on to the next slide. So just, just very briefly, this is uh, probably my last slide, but we, as I mentioned, in the fall of 2022, we have been developing a computational architecture, which we call the multimodal analysis pipeline, where we are looking at ways in which we can collect data from multiple sources. We, we are developing visualization methods uh, such that we can display this information to researchers, as, as well as uh, teachers in the classroom. We have worked out ways in which we can uh, pre-process the data, uh, align the data and time across multiple data sources, archive the data, and are now building this uh, online processing pipeline. It's clear that uh, given the complexity of what we are doing, we are going to have to use distributed computing resources. Currently, we are using multiple uh, you know, servers for data collection and analysis, but our eventual goal is to use some kind of cloud service. NSF is working uh, to help us develop these uh, cloud service resources and our eventual goal is to, will be to migrate this architecture onto cloud services and just as an example on the next slide uh we uh, we sh i I'm sh this is an example of how we are using core ai techniques developed by our co colleagues at north carolina 
so especially Mohit Bansal, who has done uh, some very good work on combining video and conversational analysis to answer questions about, say, what is happening in a particular uh, scenario. And this would be very useful for teachers also to answer queries that students might have by analyzing both the scenario as well as uh, students' uh, recent activities. And, and then lastly, being able to provide a summary, say, of uh, a sequence of, uh, over a sequence of intervals uh, as, as to what happened in the classroom for teachers. So I'll stop right here. I think I went a little over time and give Jeremy some time to present. Thank you. Well, thanks all. And listening to my colleagues, it's just uh, exciting and, and so much work ahead of us. So it's a good thing this is a five-year event. You know, my role is really to, to uh, organize a nexus, which is a form of communication between those inside the Institute and those outside. So let me tell you a little bit about that. And then hopefully we can communicate a little bit, perhaps through the Q&A. Go ahead, James. So our goal is to have a nexus that shapes AI broadly. And I work at Digital Promise. It's a nonprofit organization. And at Digital Promise, we really are very connected to schools in the United States. And so we find that something like STEM and digital learning is actually priority 19 of schools. Yet a lot of the NSF work focuses on how can we improve STEM learning. And the bubbles here represent some of the other things that schools are really concerned with. They're concerned with supporting marginalized students, student engagement, special education. And so I think we need to be talking about all these things. James, you wanna to go to the next slide? And so our vision for a Nexus is to lever leverage our strengths as a hub. Digital Promise is really a place that connects researchers, innovators, and educators. And we wanna engage on what you just heard about, the intellectual program of the Institute, but also, as we're out there talking to people about this, we find that the questions of ethics and equity are the ones that really draw the biggest communities. And so I saw one question already in the Q&A about what about privacy with all this multimodal analytics? Well, that's exactly the kind of thing we need a big community talking about. Let's, go, let's keep going. So the metaphor for the Nexus work isn't publishing a web page or holding a lot of webinars, but rather fostering conversations. And I have to thank my colleague, Carly Chilman, for being an advocate of conversation at every turn. And so we want to create conversations about what's going on in the news and about events, about the work we're doing in the Institute, and ideas and issues that are occurring outside the Institute. Let's keep going. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So we've already published a series of blogs, and each of these blogs is conversational. And we've brought together people doing the foundations of AI with people who are more educationally oriented, what, what this institute program calls use inspired. And so those blogs are really just conversations between the people because we wanna encourage more conversation. And so we have a first one with perspectives on narrative centered learning. We have discussions among people at different institutions about how we should bring in ethics into the work. We have discussions in these blogs about how to connect student learning and teacher support. And we've been experimenting with podcasts as well. For example, a series that we've done with the World Bank. Next example is on the next slide. We're gonna be hosting a forum called Envisioning Advanced Human-Centered AI for Teaching and Learning. Unfortunately, I'd let you come, but it's sold out. We wanted to start small and really make sure we got a balance of participants from research that who are practitioners and in industry. And so we're really looking forward to hosting this event and we'll let you know about it because we'll, we'll blog about it also. And in future years, we hope to open it up. Let's go to one more, James, next slide. And we've also been doing workshops with school district leaders. Uh, Digital Promise runs a thing called the League of Innovative Schools, which is really a forum where school superintendents and other high level leaders of school districts come together. And we saw in our first workshop, first of all, 50 district leaders showed up, which was amazing. And they are really enthusiastic and want to think hard about the challenges of AI and education. They see a real need to help out their teachers. All the school districts in the United States are having troubles right now retaining teachers and recruiting teachers because the job's gotten so hard. 
So all the things about classroom orchestration are, are fascinating. The school district leaders, they also want to think hard about the ethical implications. And they're starting to see the benefits of some narrative, things that approach narrative centered. They're already familiar with tools that help uh, students write essays, for example. And the district leaders are just really excited to talk more about what does it mean when uh, students have a story writing companion at their side? What can we do with that? And of course, they're worried about the risks as well. The next slide. Yeah, and so across the nexus and across the AI Engage Institute, I just want to reiterate that we're doing all this work but we are keeping a primary lens on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and who's hired to work in the Institute. It's uh, ethics is woven in from the beginning of every project or sub-project of the Institute. And in this, these Nexus activities, we're really paying a lot of attention to bringing a broad group in. Um, so with that, I think we could perhaps take a question or two if there's a format that lets us do that. Excellent. Maybe we can kick off with a question uh, for Gautam. This is kind of a an amalgamation of questions that I've seen uh, in the chat. Uh, so I will I will paraphrase and um, uh, compress. Uh, and Gautam, it's not an easy question. I'll tell you. Um, yeah. How would you uh, think about the best way to consider issues of privacy in multimodal learning analytics, but also issues of bias? Yeah, this is a great question, and I don't think I'm, I can uh, I, I sort of address it all by myself, but I'm glad we have a, a very good group of both AI ethics, AI ed ethics researchers, as well as uh, a, a group of researchers who are involved in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I did mention in my response to one of the questions that was asked, uh, about Colin Lynch, who has been looking at the data sources that we use for, for training our machine learning algorithms. We are all very aware, as, as are a number of other researchers, that uh, often bias creeps in right from the training algorithms because uh, you know the data comes from a limited uh, uh, a group or a limited population, but then uh, we try and apply it to a wider population. So, so there are uh, there is no one easy answer to this question, as you correctly point out, James. I think there are a number of issues that we will have to take care of. A, uh, for example, when we set up our multimodal analysis pipeline, uh, our teachers and students are going to have input into into what is extracted from the pipeline and what kind of analyses that are done. So, can we build in uh, filters? Right, that that are customized to different classrooms and and to different groups, such that you know we respect the, their boundaries in terms of what analyses we do. Of course, there are trade-offs because uh, if uh, you cut out certain sources of data, there are certain things that we would want to infer that we may not be able to. So we have to through through. Uh, 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 dialogue through, uh, you know, uh, through co-design approaches, make teachers and students aware of of the pros and cons of of analyzing certain kinds of data and and not others. The other big issue is. Uh, how do we anonymize the data that we are collecting? And it's easy to anonymize log data, which we've been doing for a number of years, but how do we, uh, how do we anonymize video data, which, which is really hard because we are collecting, uh, you know, uh, uh, students' faces, et cetera. And, and of course, uh, the third issue is uh, how do we make sure that our machine learning algorithms are, or, or at least how we use our machine learning algorithms, we are aware of, of the, our data sources and, and are able to tailor the inferences we draw from those algorithms accordingly. Uh, I, I know there are a number of other issues that we could discuss, but I'll stop right here and let, let others respond. Thanks, Gautam. Cindy and Jeremy, do you have comments? Let me pose a question, um, a kind of wrap-up question to uh, Cindy and Jeremy as the uh, learning science leads on our project. Um, it seems like there are so many kind of interlocking, really complex 
issues in the machinery of multimodal learning analytics, narrative-centered learning, and embodied conversational agents. And what I'm wondering is, what do you think is kind of a uh, a reasonable uh, design-based research approach to dealing with this complexity? Uh, and as you're thinking about this in the few seconds that you have to think about it, how do you layer in different learner populations? And Cindy, do you want to start? Sure. I, I think a piece of that starts with talking to the teachers and the students. Um, you know, the teachers know their kids. And as we've been learning um, with the studies that we've been doing over the years, um, I think that's one thing that's really important is to just get the voices of the folks who will be affected. So I think starting with focus groups, beginning with small scale implementation studies that look at how these moving parts are interacting. Um, and then also talking with the kids. Um, we got some interesting summaries today of our, our focus groups with kids after our fall studies. And they actually had quite a bit to say about what they would like to see the embodied conversational agents doing. And um, this is probably news because this is since we spoke this morning, um, <laughs> as well as um, the way they'd like their presence to be seen, the way they like the stories to move. So I think um, I think we're gonna do our, our best approximations and embody our, our design ideas, but then we also need to see, um, go through cycles of refinements that are responsive to different contexts. I think we can also learn an awful lot from how do our designs play out in different contexts. In a lot of my research, we've We've, we've found these kind of um, natural experiments where we've got tools that are appropriated in different ways, and we've been able to understand how there are different paths to, to um, the tools being used in ways that are productive um, that also feed back into our designs. Thanks, Jeremy. James, you've without knowing it, you've given me a, a a chance to advertise that I'm going to do a keynote tomorrow where I will discuss at length how we think about the many factors we should include. And I also want to say Danielle McNamara gave a wonderful keynote to, to kick this conference off. And she also introduced a lovely picture of those factors. So I would just invite everyone to uh, in about tw it's uh, 25 hours from now. Uh, please come join me for, for, for my keynote and we'll carry on the conversation about how to think about AI in support of multi-factor approaches to learning. Excellent. Thanks. We'll all look forward to this. Um, so let's thank our uh, panelists again. Uh, a great uh, discussion here at the end. And many thanks to uh, everyone for sticking around. As Gautam said, we recognize you're in many different time zones, so we really appreciate it. Thanks so much and happy conferencing. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.